Okay, let's start the show. For Thursday, December 19th, 2019, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. <laughs> And welcome to the podcast this week as I adjust my headphone levels. Oh, what a week it is. It may, yeah, I'm just going to go out here and commit you guys to next week. It's not our final podcast of the decade. You don't know that. We have not committed. I'm committing you guys right now. <laughs> Even if it means... We're, we're going to get a phone call. There's going to be one more podcast where I am doing this alone in my house with a camera on me <laughs> with two... Uh, avatars of, of you guys yeah. that will not respond. We're going to have one more episode because there is so much to talk about that we can't talk about right now mm -hmm. physically because like we haven't seen the rise of Skywalker That's at this right. point. That's true. One of us will see it today, this being Wednesday. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I'm very wary of these things. I know you guys uh, are smart and are muting certain terms on Twitter, but even the mention of like, oh, I'm going to see something, I'm going to see it soon, I think, uh, unfortunately, invites trolls to troll you. And so... But this won't be out until that, after you've seen it. That's why I'm comfortable even saying You're this fine. right now. Yeah, You're Jeremy, fine. I'm sorry. I've already invited the trolls to troll you. Please stay <laughs> off Twitter. That is your responsibility Do you know and prerogative. What? Do you know what? I've turned a new leaf. I watched most of the red carpet what? I'm you, you attended a Fortnite event. I'm completely open to spoilers. That I I say give it to me. No, no. This is no. I no. I'm done with trying to avoid this stuff and keep this sacred because I've seen enough Star Wars films in adulthood to realize that I don't even care anymore, oh Norman. Oh my god. Wow. Just bring oh, whatever you got. This join the world in celebrating the movie nobody's seen yet. Look, I'm looking forward <laughs> to 2020 when Jeremy releases Zen and the Art of Star Wars. Oh. Your book on how you're handling this. This the is views ridiculous. Of Jeremy Williams, one Jeremy Williams yeah. do not reflect yeah. those of test.com nor the other members of This is Only a Test. We remain optimistic and enthusiastic. You'll get there. Even though <laughs> Even though at the point uh, today, uh, we have not, um, we've seen at least a Rotten Tomatoes score. No, we haven't. Somebody at the tested <laughs> oh, office ruined it for us. None of us in this room. No. The person you would least expect. <laughs> I know. I know. It's rather unfortunate. <laughs> but how are you guys doing? Jeremy Williams, Kishore, Hari? Uh, the holiday spirit is upon me. I'm ready. We're, we're hosting uh, Christmas this year. I'm I'm going full tourist in San Francisco. What does that mean? How many people are you hosting? Uh, there will be 13 of us. Oh, Holy cannoli. my yeah. goodness. But that includes myself. <laughs> I mean, I would hope so. You would not be excluded to your own event. Um, Jeremy, how about you? Uh, I am looking forward to... I, I, I am in a state of bliss having shipped all of my Christmas presents. Oh, I got, wow. Like that is what the Christmas holidays it stresses me out the most is just getting the presents out because I got family all over the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I did that on Monday on schedule and I wrapped everything myself. I didn't ship wait, a wait. single thing from Amazon. So I'm sorry, you like, even if you bought something from Amazon, you yeah. got it out of the box, rewrapped it, and then put it in a shipping box, presumably. So everything is like box within box. Yes. Wrapped, put into a box, wrapped by myself with a note handwritten. Wow. That wow. itself is the gift. You know, there should be, I, would exactly. be, I wouldn't be surprised if there was nothing inside the then Christmas present, and except another note that says the effort was put in for me to That's exactly right. Did you wrap. use the, the new rage from Twitter, which is turning the box diagonally to get extra coverage of your gift wrap? Yeah, yeah. I, I learned about that after I needed that advice. <laughs> but that is good advice. That is good. I love going out to the malls during uh, this time of year. You know, obviously it's very festive, a lot of decor, decorations, and, uh, you know, support this, some local high school student who they have those stations set up that they will help wrap boxes for you. And I remember doing that back in high school. Wait, and where? At the mall? At the mall. They for set up kiosks and like, it's yeah. tip based. Like you, you pay uh, and they will help. And, and no usually one wraps some... a present better than a high school student who's wrapped their, you know, books in, in, um, in, in 
Safeway bags. Yeah, usually like life. a um, a store will donate the gift wrap and stuff and supplies, yeah. and so it's just all going to support some local charity or local high do, school. Do group. you remember when Amazon used to actually wrap gifts that were gift wrapped and not just put them in a bag? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that this used to be what happened. Like they would take they had actual paper and tape. <laughs> Not anymore. Oh my god! Uh, also, we were also able to take Avery to the local mall and get his first photos with Santa. And I gotta say, yeah. I have a few thoughts about this. Like, how did, one, how, how did he handle it? Well. I mean, he was great. Okay. He, he was a champ. I mean, he actually did not deliver what we had hoped. We got three photos when we had hoped one of them would be crying, screaming. Mm-hmm. We wanted a happy and we wanted a screaming, you know, and he was happy throughout. So he helped. He oh, took it like terrible. A, I know. Exactly. How could you do betray us yeah. like that, son? Yeah. A couple <laughs> thoughts about the mall Santa photography experience. One. Uh, I appreciate that it happens. I don't mind the fee. It's expensive. It's like 50 bucks. What? What? Yeah. It's 50 bucks because they know they can they can. Do you get a letter price. from Santa for that? No, it- you get a couple printouts that they print off of a off-the-shelf photo printer from like Office Depot right there. And you get d- the digital prints as, you know, relatively low-res JPEGs that go through some type of bad image processing. Uh, I don't mind the price. It's very expensive, but... If it's going to be something I do once a year, it supports the employees there, it supports this business, fine. I wish they would actually get good equipment. I was sitting there and I was looking at that camera they were using. They were using <laughs> like not even a APS-C sensor DSLR. Yeah, it had in- interchangeable lenses. It was like a micro four-third sensor. Oh, no. uh, the, the lighting was flat. It was framed improperly. Like I was just... I was judgy about their photography setup. Now, I understand they go through hundreds of families a day. Yeah. And they really want to capture the moment. That's going to be the important part, you know, capturing the moment. And it's tough when you have unpredictability of of families and children. Uh, I will say Santa himself, a pro. Santa knew exactly how to hold the baby. This is his time to, of year, man. He oh, comes out. He, he, he knew exactly how to cheese it up and, and get exactly right moments. Santa not blinking for these photos. You're yeah. not going to need a, 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 you know, Santa, Santa was, uh, was and, and giving different type of smiles. He was, he was wonderful. Wow. Was yeah. this at Stonestown, by this the way? This was at Stonestown. Yeah, I've seen their Santa set up. Yeah. He seems like a good Santa. Yeah, yeah. I, I wonder if it's the same one every year that they get. What do you, like the same... What are you implying? It's Santa. It's Santa. <laughs> uh, the way that they have this set up this mall is just your typical big Christmas tree with the giant chair, some presents around. Uh, I've seen other setups. I, you know, traveling around middle of America, like even at Thanksgiving, we saw a Santa setup where there was a little more diorama set up you mm. know, inside. Like they had had, it was more like a living room set up. And I wish we had mm. that here. But you know, for the first of hopefully many Santa photos I've got to take. Are you at fifty dollars, dude? I can't believe you did that. Yeah. If That's that was a, a lot. if that it was the price, lot, if but... that was the pricing back back when my kid was on, I'd be like, Santa's not real, dude. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess you go to Comic Con and you pay thirty bucks to get you know Brent Spiner's yeah photo. Right. Santa's you haven't been the to photos com- here. You haven't been to Comic Con for a while, my friend. It's well, not thirty dollars. What is it? It like most pictures now are like seventy five. <gasps> are you serious? Depends on the con. I think it depends, depends on the, the depends con. on the market. Wow. And what the market will sustain. Yeah, but you're looking at fifty dollars and up, my friend. All right. For most people. Well, the, I, Santa must have gone to Comic Con and learned a thing or two. <laughs> <laughs> and and like part of me is like Oh, I wish I just brought my own camera because they say no personal photos, but I could just be like a tourist walking around and like gorilla taking some some photos and then off to the side, pulling family side, hey, for five bucks, I'll give you some really <laughs> nice photos. <laughs> yeah. And just hang out there all day. I wonder how long it would take before they would just, uh, you know, usher me away. Uh, one photo. Yeah, would one be- photo. <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, I'm just getting some mall photos here. It's a free country. <laughs> I have my rights. Yeah. So that was that was my past weekend experience. Um, let's cut through the chit chat oh. and get to our. Top story this week. Was there any debate about the top story? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's the my. end of an era. Oh my! The end saga of a saga is over. 
When, now we've said this before. We said this in 1983, right? We said this whenever the the prequels. The ended. saga concludes, and now it's the prequel or the, it's the, no, we, the trilogy see, of trilogies. See, but we said it with different intonation. Like in '83, we're like the saga is over, and we were sad. Yeah. Uh, after the prequels, we were like, you know, Happy. relieved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I feel like I, I don't know where I'm at with this. I, I've had an up and down relationship with uh, with uh, these two films. And so I feel a little uneasy going into this one. It's so interesting because this is definitely, it feels like it's J.J. Abrams, of course, coming back to direct this. And from the earlier reviews, it feels like a J.J. Abrams film. So as a trilogy itself, it doesn't feel like it's going to be cohesive uh, in the same way that it could. It would be if it was like the Russo brothers directing three Marvel films in a row. Well, the original trilogy had three different directors. That's that's very true. And it also didn't feel cohesive. And the uh, prequel trilogy had the same director. Return of the Jedi. As soon as the Ewoks did. show up, it, like that's it loses cohesion. Uh, and I'm th- I think back to when the prequel trilogy concluded, when Revenge of the Sith came out, and how by that point we were all so beaten down, and we we were. We were in, we were all had some form of PTSD that we all lived in like a reality distortion bubble. I remember coming out of Revenge of the Sith and everyone was like, this is finally it. Oh my God, they finally got it right yeah. after two movies. I remember Kevin Smith saying that before. I yeah. Went. Yeah. And it, of course, that one opened with that incredible space battle, uh, that long shot as they get into, as Anakin's flying uh, his starfighter. And I wonder if that will be the case for this time as well. Regardless of what you thought about Last Jedi and and Force Awakens, where you feel like you know b- because it is the conclusion of something, they're putting all the chips on the table, and it is that final relief that it's out. No more hiding from spoilers. Mm-hmm. No more anticipation. The saga is done. Will that just the end of it lift this movie into a, a another reality distortion bubble? <clears throat> I don't. I don't understand the question. Yeah, I. You Are know, we going to be wrong about our thoughts about this movie five years later? Ah, I I don't think so. And in a way, this is a weird we'll ending for well. me. In the way, I don't think it'll age. I have very low expectations for this movie. And I think that's the right place to be. Um, but I think part of the reason I feel a little like that, it, um, that the ending is what's happening in real life around it, that Carrie Fisher died. Like Harrison Ford like leaving the film, like um, Mark, like there's a um, uh, Peter Mayhew dying, like all of these things, like there's these, the people behind those characters are, uh, are leaving more than anything else. So there's a finality that I think is just going to happen that we're going to see it and it's going to be what it is. And I don't think it's going to age much differently. It's going to be what it is, is, the the saddest thing, the saddest perspective we could have. It's low expectations at this point. come come to fruition. I I have perspective here. I had an interesting experience over the weekend where I showed my twelve year old son one of my favorite movies of all time. It's one of the movies that I have called my favorite movie in years past. It's Rushmore by Wes Anderson. Mm-hmm. And one, he didn't love it. He's 12. He's never been in love. Like, that's, you You got to go through certain things. You have to be in a certain phase of life when you appreciate certain things. Yeah. You haven't sent him away for, to boarding school yet. Right. Like, all of those things. And and I am so far, I'm decades past that point in my life where I loved that movie, that it didn't resonate with me as much. And so mm-hmm. what I realized is this, what everybody, you know, I think already knows on some level, which is that Star Wars is for kids. And Star Wars appeals to I'm not which is not to say that not you you can't be an inner child. It's not to say that it can't be, you know, adults and like the films, but you have to be at a certain point in life to get what you got out of it when I was nine and I loved Jedi. And that doesn't preclude the ability for a film to ha- to mean something different and be meaningful for an older audience in the way a Pixar film reads differently for kids and adults. Right, and but I think Pixar films intentionally resonate with, with different demographics. And I, I'm Intentionally? Not, you don't think Star Wars... I'm not... I, I think Star Wars has been mishandled ever since, you know, 1983. Um, I, I'm in, I love uh, Mandalorian. You know, mm-hmm. you, you think it's, it's fallen short of its potential, yep. but I, I think that the last episode in particular... I haven't seen it yet. There's no way that, that this n- new Star Wars film can live up to that single episode. Really? 
I think. Oh the, my! Wow, that's wow. I'm going to go home and watch that right now. Um, <laughs> I think the indictment of the new newest two films, and and probably what I expect from the third film, is it feels uh, like the fingerprints of a of a cor- mega corporation on it. Like so many cooks in the kitchen, the creative direction kind of bouncing back and forth. Um, that you don't get that like singular vision that has weird moments. Like we're not going to get a Porkins anymore. Like a character that just shows up unexplained, uh, dies and becomes like a beloved character. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I think like you you say that, but like even in Solo, a film that was not as well regarded, had the John Favreau character that I think is is exactly that. Is that a Porkins? Part though? of the part of the problem with, with Porkins it, it not part existing anymore is that Porkins was per- was well cast. Like, he was a dude who was, like, in this movie. Nobody knew it was going to be a special film. They thought they were hoping it would be a box office, you know, break even. And he was cast as a space pilot. Nobody knew it was going to be... No one had the expectations for and, it to be a special film. And nowadays, everyone playing a Porkins role is somebody's friend or niece or nephew who wants to be in a Star Wars film. They're not even actors. And that comes across. Or they, they are actors, but you recognize as bit players and character right, actors. Right, exactly. But they think it's not going to matter. They think they, th- they can throw these you know fans into small bit parts and it won't affect the film. And it probably doesn't for kids. Mm-hmm. But part of the problem with being an adult is you start to recognize all the beats of storytelling and it, you, you see foreshadowing that's, you know, spoon fed and you it just it's not as enjoyable. You want to be surprised um, unless there is an adult, you know, oriented like uh, fabric woven into it like Pixar does. So mm-hmm. low expectations, perspective slash cynicism aside, um, I still think this is going to be an enjoyable film. I think the action sequences. Uh, especially probably the what I anticipate some major lightsaber duels between Kylo and Rey are are going to be spectacular. Um, I I just think there's going to be an element of of cheese later on top that I worry about, but I think it's going to be a beautiful film, and I think there's going to be moments that are great. Daisy Ridley has has nailed every part of these movies that she's been in. She's the best part of them. And so I expect nothing less from her in, in the in this movie. I watched The Force Awakens last night or yesterday um, in preparation. I watched The Last Jedi probably Thursday night, and uh, I'm tr- I try so hard to like let go of my of what I need that film to let be. Let go of your fear. Do you need Ben Kenobi? Let go of your be, hate. Let go. Of your Jeremy. You know, I thought after f- what what's it been four years that that I that I'd be able to approach it with fresh eyes and just let. And some of it I could, and I really, and I really do appreciate, as you said, the action sequences and some of the, some of the the moments in the movie, like where uh, Solo dies. Th- these were well done, and I I liked them, but so much of it is ham fisted, mm-hmm. and I, oh man, I f- I feel even more. Uh, the Last Jedi did not resonate with me, as I recall. Mm-hmm. I think it's okay to take Star Wars off the pedestal. The tr- original trilogy will still exist. I mean, hopefully the original original trilogy, pre-special editions, will come out at some point, and we can love those films. But yeah, I, I'm okay with... Uh, the reality is we're not going to not have Star Wars, new Star Wars, in our lifetimes. And they have said that they're treating it as a more precious... Uh, property, not like a, a Marvel series or uh, the MCU, uh, and they should be special. Uh, and so after this is done, they'll take a break, and, and I'll be excited to see something that's not the Skywalker saga. Yep. Any speculations? Of what that is? No, 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 of what this movie will entail. Like, who's Ray? Like, that's a... a... I, I don't even want to play that game. Yeah. I, I, I'm actually... I, I like not thinking about it. I made that mistake with Watchmen, where I dove too much into the online discussion around it, and it took some of the surprises away, mm. which decreased some of my, my potential enjoyment. It's all that pressure that they have to connect dots that makes these films ham-fisted. Like, I felt like, having just watched Force Awakens, like when they stumble upon the Falcon, like it's on this random planet, what are yeah. the odds of that? And then, what are the, what are the odds? Solo, Don't tell me the odds. Solo, Solo and Chewie, like tractor beam, they happen to see the Falcon in space? No, <laughs> they, they detect them. They detected the ship. Do they? Yeah. Yeah. I I think from, I mean, ha- from how far away? I've been playing that speculation game in my head for a while because I it's hard to avoid it. Uh and I think the only thing that makes real sense to me, like I know the Ray lineage will finally be explained somehow, some way. Nothing in that era era makes sense to me. 
so the only thing that I, I think is definitely going to happen is we're going to get the redemption of Ben Solo. I think that's... You think the redemption is going to happen? I think... Uh, as, I think there'll be redemption for... Well, him. that would follow the original trilogy arc. And, and Leia said that she felt there was good in him. Oh, and I think this is a Leia story, not a Luke story. I think she's going to be a, a key... This is a, this is a Rey story. Well, for sure. I think Leia is going to be the Yoda figure of the story. Yeah. Um, but my wild prediction, I have mm -hmm. a wild prediction. I think Harrison Ford is in this movie. <gasps> <gasps> Whoa. That's my wild See, prediction. I don't even, I, now I don't even. I, that's the reason I don't even want to speculate. Because but now how can he be in the you, story? You, right? That's like my crazy. You've incepted an idea that I didn't even consider, and now any cue, any foreshadowing of any of that became a surprise. Uh, that would ruin my the, my complete shock because oh, now I'm you sorry. have taken that shock. I'm sorry. Of that potential but surprise. But how can he? Like it I, makes I no imagine. sense. It, it would makes make, it would make no, no sense. sense. I'm just gonna not think about that. And it's like if Yaddle <laughs> came back. Everybody would be like, why is Yaddle here? You know, I, you I'm know, trying to make Yaddle a thing. I, I want to. I, I am envious of you guys for because your world of, of comic books has really taken over. Like the whole Marvel Cinematic Universe is so successful and and great. Like they're good at what they do, and they're just nailing film after film. Uh, I'm envious of you guys that you have that, and, and I'm glad to be on that train with you. Uh, last thing related to Star Wars, Jeremy, this also bleeds into technology and video gaming. You attended or uh, watched the Star Wars <laughs> Fortnite oh, okay. event. I thought you were going to say the, the Rise of the Skywalker red carpet, because no. I, I did watch some of that, but I did not attend it. The, um, yeah, the Fortnite event was, was fascinating. Um, I guess they announced that during the Game Awards, that, that it would be happening. And so my 12-year-old my son, who doesn't even play Fortnite anymore, he was curious enough to boot it up and check yeah. it out. And I got to say, like, that felt like the future because at, what was it, like 10, 8 p.m.? I forget when it was. Whenever it was, Jeff Keighley came on the, the, like, the sound speaker. Like, everybody in the game. How, how many millions of people playing Fortnite? Everybody e heard on him. On every server. Everybody heard him talk. And he said, testing, one, two, one, oh two, testing. The voice of God. It's the end of Truman Show. Who are you? And I am uh, the creator. <laughs> exactly. That was exactly what it was like. And, and my son flipped out. He called me. He's like, <laughs> Dad, you won't believe what just happened. Jeff just came on the loudspeaker. Jeff just came on the loudspeaker. <laughs> and then, so I, I, I go down, because like, I even can't be bothered with Star Wars these days, so I had to be like enticed to go watch this thing. And so I went down, and it's 10 minutes late, so they get everybody a chance to get in there, and then at 10 minutes after the deadline, nobody can hurt each other anymore. <gasps> oh. He brought peace upon the world. <laughs> <laughs> This is like a Watchmen crossover. And then... I did it 35 minutes ago. And then uh, my son said, what... He, he saw something on the screen that said, focus. And I guess he doesn't do that that often. But it said, what is, what is focus? And so he hit L2 to focus. And it, it moved the camera onto the sky. And then a beat later, the Millennium Falcon warps in. And all the Star Wars music comes on. <laughs> and the, the Falcon swoops around the landscape. Wait, wait, wait. So on each server... As yeah. people are playing, let's say you're in the middle of a, uh, a round where the th last three people are surviving, and they're like hunting each other. Oh, and this is actually, there was only one game mode you could join, and, oh. it, and it was the special event. Okay, so it wasn't an actual no. combat no. engagement where they're like, peace, we'll be, let's <laughs> pause our conflict for 30 minutes it, with this special message from our sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> it was, though. It, you could fight. Like, there you were could. teams. But I, I don't know if What if one person's like, not interested, like, what are you guys looking at? What are you guys looking at up there? He was, I just want to play. When, when people died, they would respawn. So I don't, it must have been a special kind of like deathmatch kind of situation. Okay, so the Falcon comes So the Falcon down. trailed by TIE fighters and Star Destroyers warp in. And they, the Falcon does some pretty amazing flights. Uh, what do you call them? Like uh, dogfight moves. And then um, destroys the TIE fighters and then lands on the platform. Actually, everybody who's standing on the platform gets blown off of it. And then the Falcon lands, out comes like a hologram that that is Jeff Keeley basically, but it's not him. Like he's just speaking through the. It's not his avatar. It's oh, okay. some generic hologram avatar. He speaks through it, and then a stormtrooper comes off and starts talking to everybody. I don't know what the point of that was, but apparently, like he says, he's in the next film. <laughs> Oh, you know who that was? No, I don't know who that was. That was um, Ben Schwartz from um, the um, from Parks and Rec. Ah, uh, because he did sound very comfortable. 
Like he sounded like a celebrity. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, of course, JJ runs down the ramp of the Falcon. A character. This is not video. This is no. This is a three D avatar. Right. Custom made this is for machinima. JJ Abrams. Do you think this. he's like? He did performance capture, or he's holding a gamepad, or, or a YSD keyboard. Unfortunately, like, it looked like all of his animations were canned, and so even his walk and his his uh, emotes. So, how did people? Was this streamed, or like, did you download the animation package and all the assets as a player locally, and yeah. this was rendered locally? Yeah, it was all rendered locally. So you had the assets queued up on your computer. Yes, you have JJ on your PC. People did not know they had the Falcon and Tie Fighters. Right, in and their, so JJ comes on, on and then he's like, "Oh, look how skinny I am! I've never been so skinny." And he's making a jokes. Whole bit. Yeah, he's the whole thing. And then like he does dancing, and then like they turn him into something else. And then oh, he they turn him into like the default Fortnite player, which I guess is an inside joke for Fortnite players. And then he okay. changed back to JJ. And uh, he said, well, anyway, I'd like to show you. What do you think that this clip's going to be about? And then you could stand in any of four quadrants, and you could guess, you could vote for what you thought the clip was going to be about. And then uh, so players were like running yeah into like, a quadrant, and then so you, you voted, which had no effect, and then you got to <laughs> you got to watch the clip. Uh, which Don't describe the clip. I won't. It came down on a big screen. Watch the clip, which is like thirty seconds. You could describe the clip and not spoil anything, and then um, you put up the Rotten Tomato score. <laughs> <laughs> and then they, they said, that's it, and uh, we want to thank you all for coming out. And uh, one more question, what's your favorite color? And then everyone votes on their favorite color, and then they fly off in the Falcon, and then everybody has a lightsaber in the color that they voted on. What? Yeah, and the red one is Kylo's, so you get the, the cool thing at the bottom. The hilt, um, yeah. And, the, the, and the lightsaber is pretty thing. powerful, right? And it can like deflect. And so then everybody goes, jumps into this massive lightsaber battle. Oh my God. And now everyone in Fortnite has lightsabers. Wait, for the foreseeable future? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. As, or as a permanent? I think it's a permanent thing. No, it's a loot item, though, after that game. Like, okay. you have to go find it in the game. It doesn't just, like, uh, So everyone who was in the event got it, and everyone else has to find it. Is that how it works? Yeah, I don't think you get to keep it. I think it's, like, every time you join a game now, oh. you have to find it on the map. Oh, really? Okay, well, there you go. Wow. What a what a technical achievement. That, was, that's, a, that's, like, some, that's a, a digital event. Yeah, unlike anything in recent memory, because it crosses over. It wasn't just people who care about the game. I mean, of course, there's really haven't been very few games that have uh, been played at the scale. Uh, Marshmallow did a, a concert in Fortnite, and the, the, that was sort of the, I think the test bed for this technology. This makes me think of like Ready Player One, when when um, when Holiday passed away, and then the announcement, the video comes up in the beginning of the film, yeah. was the book, and everyone in the Oasis pauses and watches the video. Right. Like this is that type of let's, let's, <laughs> let's, our differences don't matter right now. Yeah. Let us consume. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This marketing. I mean, I thought it was, I thought it was brilliant. It really did feel futuristic. Uh, I don't know. And you watch it over the shoulder? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was fine. Did you feel like you missed out because you weren't like on a phone or on, on a, you <laughs> had your avatar running around and voting and participating? Oh, it, well, only in from that sense that I didn't actually get something, but you know whatever I was since I don't have a dog in the race of Fortnite, I am totally fine with that. Oh, interesting. I, I can't wait. What what's the next big event? Didn't they they did a, a, a end game event, mm -hmm. right? And so this where is you can get the Infinity Gauntlet. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah, it's definitely it's a yeah it's a, it's a cool futuristic thing. I thought that was neat. Mm. Is that uh, all? That's it. Okay, we'll move on. Nope. Sure. Just a real brief apology. Like, I know people don't want to hear people like t being negative about Star Wars. I know that. I know that, and I apologize. And we're done because th they're done. So we're done. All right, that's it. <laughs> okay, okay. Hey, other movies. Uh, we're gonna get through this relatively quickly. We had a, a second trailer for Pixar's upcoming film Onward. Uh, this is a film. Um, I'm. <sighs> <laughs> I'm, I'm mixed on. I'm mixed on totally. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, I'm not super just, pumped by. Just bring me soul. Like that's how I yeah, kind of feel. Right. Yeah. It's not even like that. It's a, like it's not because it's not uh, like a sequel. Like of course I was very hyped for uh, Incredibles four and Toy Story four or Incredibles two and Toy Story four, <laughs> but uh, like yeah. it's not that it's not a sequel. Yeah. I I appreciate original stories, but like I'm looking more forward to 
to Soul yeah. than than this. Pete Doctor's new. This film. doesn't yeah. feel as universal. It's more of a sci-fi fan a fantasy epic kind of tale. Uh, I mean, like it's it's from Pixar. They have a good lineage. It could be good, but it just seems to. They have the best lineage in terms of the the trailer. It didn't represent this like core thing, though. It is about kids trying to find their dad. I mean, I'm not spoiling very much, um, yep. and probably that's going to reveal a lot. Yeah, I guess they only we see in the trailer they only are able to uh, bring back their dad for one day, and they do bring back half of him. <laughs> So there's going to be some some heartstrings to pull here, you know, relationships between uh, families and lost family members. It's a road trip movie. They're calling it. You know, it's a quest. So their take on a road trip, the genre, mm-hmm. and it's not that that's not an exciting genre. I, I'm just I'm waiting for the one thing in this film that kind of hooks me in, and yeah. I haven't haven't seen it yet from this trailer. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna watch it. I just. I, I, I watched freaking Angry Birds, dude. I, I will watch this for sure. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, I'm not I'm not worried about not seeing it and with my expectations so low, they can only be on the flip ex- side exceeded. Though I am excited about this. Oh, there we got goes. a first look. Bill and Ted. Three pictures from the uh, Bill and Ted sequel, Bill and Ted Three, uh, mm-hmm. were released. You have a shaven Keanu Reeves. Um you have the first uh, look at uh, William Sadler is back as Death. Hopefully, that's not too big of a spoiler. But from Bogus Journey. From Bo- uh, from uh, yeah, Bo- that, the second film. Yeah, that'd be Bogus Journey. And then you also he looks he looks looking a little old there, Jeff. And then it, it is of course about legacy. So you have Bill and Ted's children. She's from Atypical. The the Bill uh, Keanu Reeves the is he Bill or Ted? I never remember. What? Her, I know, but she is. She plays Keanu Reeves' daughter. Oh, really? Yeah, and 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 the other one um, uh, from the movie The Babysitter and um, Ready or Not, she plays um, what's his name? The other guy's daughter. Bill S. Preston S. Yes, Esquire? Bill's daughter. How about that? Yeah. So it will be about family. Cool. Very excited for that. Uh, I am also of mixed feelings for a upcoming comic book movie. It's an animated adaptation of the. Elseworld story, Red Sun. I'm ready to give you a history lesson here. S O N. A red S. Yeah, Red Sun. Superman, Red Sun. Have you heard about this? Uh, no. I've heard about it. I'm not watching the trailer because so, I, I don't want to know. Superman, Red Sun was a uh, uh, mini series story that was told an alternate reality mm-hmm. uh, Superman of what if? What if Superman, his ship from Krypton landed? in Soviet Russia. Oh, yeah, cool. And was raised by Stalin mm-hmm. and lived, grew, grew up to be a communist. How would the world accept him or what would his, how, how would the world have changed? That's right. You are a product of where you uh, grow up. That's right. It's the, the, the nature versus nurture of it all. And there are familiar faces from the DC universe, ranging from uh, Wonder Woman, Batman, Lois Lane, even Lex Luthor, and some other surprises, and it's it was it's well regarded it's by Mark Miller, who was the writer behind Kick Ass, among on the many other high concept uh, graphic novels and comic series, and this one is definitely high concept. Um, the miniseries was great, and so now it's being adapted into a animated film, part of that DCU animated universe. Um, Jason Isaacs plays. Superman does the voice of Superman with a definitely a Russian accent, which was kind of weird, even though I, I expected him to have it. It's a very heavy Russian accent. And um, it, I think some of the DC animated films have been good. Some, I think, are just like exercises They've been slipping. in adaptation. They've been slipping recently. Yeah, it's tough to do these films and, and live up to what you've imagined in your head and what you've seen in the graphic novels. Uh, uh, one more trailer, In the Heights. This is Lin Dude. Manuel Miranda's Tony Award winning musical, the one he did before Can I play Hamilton. The music? We cannot yeah. play the music, ah! but uh, it is the film adaptation of that. This is a more traditional film adaptation uh, rather than uh, what, Le, uh, what they did with Limez. So this will have the music and it's filmed traditionally. Um, You're saying that they didn't live record, live record the, it. the vocals? Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, which is too bad because I do think that, that that adds a lot to the live performance aspect. They, they could have done that, I think. 
Mm. Assuming that they have all the same people doing the acting as they do doing the Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, the cast for this is like what they did for Rent, where they brought back the original cast members. Well, the guy playing the, the lead is. It is? Yeah, okay. he, he played the lead in on oh, Broadway. Oh, okay. And he played um, uh, Philip Schuyler. On, oh, in a in on Broadway. Oh, what's his? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, yeah. But good, not good not him. Skyler. It would no, no, be no. Philip Ham- Hamilton, right? Yeah, yes. He played son. Hamilton's son as yeah, yeah. well as uh, John Lawrence. Right, exactly. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, he's. I like him. Uh, he was in the uh, Lady Gaga. Uh, um, so, yes. Movie. Does this imply to you what it implies to me, which is like if this is a hit, then, then they'll, the do the, it. they'll do the same thing for Hamilton? No, Lin Manuel has said that Hamilton will never be adapted into uh, a traditional film. What they did, they filmed two performances with the original cast, and that is being cut right now for theatrical release. I mean, that'll be live vocals. Just, that will. just that wait. Will. I mean, he's been on this epic tear. That's what I'm Every, saying. Everything he touches turns to gold, and then he's going to have a miss. Did you see Mary Poppins? Oh, my problem is fine. Exactly, it was just fine. <laughs> oh, Mo- fair. Moana was fine. Moana was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I, nice. mean, I will was, not have. There was no frozen. The besmirching of Moana <laughs> I on agree. this podcast. I went to a Moana sing along. I was like bawling for most of it. Have you seen Frozen two? By the way, I have not. I'm really fed up with you two. Why? What do we do? Because things I, that annoy me. There are things we could talk about in that film, and you guys are too macho to go see some. It's no, it's, it's not, not a macho all. thing. It's right. purely no. a time constraint. No. Well, it, I, my kid hated Frozen, and he's like, I, I was like, do you want to go see Frozen too? Hmm. He's, he's like, too no. macho for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's sure. no question. I'm not too macho for it. <laughs> okay, most of my. Watching is of cartoons in some form. Well, we'll, we'll talk about it when you guys eventually see it. Okay, okay. Get Pro- to probably it. in the new year. All right. Yeah. Uh, what will probably not come and actually won't come in the new year or any year forthcoming after that is uh, the Akira film from Taika Waititi. Warner Brothers has removed the film from the schedule. It's rather unfortunate. Of course, Taika is now doing Thor. Uh, what is it? Love and Thunder. Mm-hmm. And and so, but we. Yeah, you know, hard work worker thought, but we were also really hoping that he'd be able to do the Akira adaptation. You know, that's going to be in limbo for for a long time. Uh, we are less than one month. Is that correct? Less than one month away from Star Trek Picard. Wow. What? How do you know that? When does it come out? It's January. January twenty third. Like, I want to say. Okay, so we're we're just about a month away from Star Trek Picard, and that's going to be a weekly release cycle. Yes. All right. On CBS All Access, but. CBS has enough confidence in the show that they've already renewed it for season two. That's good, man. I don't like that. I like that. I don't. I wanted to have at least the the, the speculation that it could be the limited series. Like the fact that they've already announced season two tells me that you know Picard probably doesn't die at the end of this. Not that I wanted him to, but I wanted to be worried that he would. Oh boy! By the end of the series. <laughs> Look at you. It gives away. Is that how you felt about Next Generation? It's like, oh, man, now I know there's another season. Now I know Picard doesn't die. (laughs) The stakes are a little bit lower. Don't be so sure. What if there's another Picard? It is. Oh. Then they, they they wouldn't renew a show without his involvement. All I'm doing is just planting ideas in Norm's head throughout the Christmas season. Mm. (laughs) That's good. Mm. Harrison Ford is still alive this is somehow. So, this is so different than you know not knowing whether there'd be another season of Expanse or Next Generation because this is a revival. This is mm. built as something special as a limited engagement to and that they had a good idea and they want to execute it. Not just you know, uh, and of course I'm happy that all the the crew and the cast and and the, the people working on the show are going to hopefully come back and get a chance to further the story. But I also am a fan of stories that have proper beginning, middles, and ends and. Dude, try to try to be a little optimistic here. This is this tells you that they are so sure about this series. Like they have seen the episodes and they're like slam dunk. They crunch the numbers. They're like already people are subscribing to all access. <laughs> I'm with I'm with Jeremy on this. This is nothing but good news. Yeah, I, I'll try to be optimistic about that. I mean, I'm definitely optimistic about the show. So very, so but. Yeah, hold out hope. Having, yeah. Hold out hope that he'll die. Norm. Just hold, <laughs> no. hold out hope. <laughs> hold out hope that there will be tension that will make me wonder that whether or not some of the characters won't make it, and knowing that there will be a second season. You've watched too much that. Game of Thrones. 
I just, I think I finally realized Norm is part of the Borg Collective, and that's why he's rooting for Picard <laughs> oh, to die. Yeah, yeah. It like, finally Lakitas. makes sense. <laughs> give, give me a cliffhanger. If you're going to do that, give me a cliffhanger on the scale of Best of Both Worlds. Oh, God, yeah. yeah. And make, and made us, make us a year, wait a year for it. Uh, something that we're going to get in 2020, theoretically, on the platform Chibi, Kibi, Quibi? Mm-hmm. Chibi, yep. Chibi, Q U I B I. This is that short form social network video service. Uh, all the content is going to be real short. Is a return to Legends of the Hidden Temple. This was of my generation in the '90s, growing up. Very popular Nickelodeon game show. Uh, it was wish. It was, it, it was all the fantasy that 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 kids of my age wanted of climbing through, you know, and uh, a, a, a obstacle course set decked to be a uh, a South American temple, and wait, it was always the same obstacle course. They would re- they could rearrange. Oh wow! It was like a cross section of the obstacle course, so you could see the the contestants going, you know, running alongside. But the room layouts would slightly change, and the place where they find the objects. And okay. Every kid in my generation watches wanted to run through that course. Wow! And The Rock is bringing this show to adult. In 2020, it's a revival where it will be adults who get to run through a new Com- version of this course. combination, like Ninja Warrior and oh, I hope so, and Legends of the Hidden yeah. Temple. Yeah. You know, uh, since you're watching the live stream, you know one of the hosts of that live stream, Anthony Carboni, was on this show as a kid, just as a regular kid. Mm-hmm. Wow, you can watch his episode. It's where uh, he caught the bug. Yeah, that's uh, that's right. And last bit of pop culture news. Weirdest story of the week. The Far Side. Gary Larson. Gary Larson's Far Side is going to be online for the first time. Uh, And, well, yeah, you can't find Far Side comics online. Okay. He's been notably resistant to it because of people stealing his comics and and posting them everywhere else. Image of the Far Side you find through Google Image is a pirated, scanned image. Okay. And there will be new, new comics. Well, where's it going to be found? On the farside.com. It's like, I, I remember this so fondly. Mm-hmm. The comic? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, dude. This, yeah. The, the one frame. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Br- absolute brilliance. I was promised that when I paid an exorbitant amount of money for the complete Farside <laughs> two book anthology compendium, that it would be complete? That it would be complete. <laughs> How dare they release more? Yeah. And make my collection now obsolete. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Titlement 101. All right, that does it for pop culture. Let's move on. Oh, wow. That was fast. This is great, though, because I, I can't wait to see what he has to say about the internet. <laughs> Right? <laughs> That's right. It's been offline since the internet yeah. basically existed. He's got a lot going on there, but Yeah, I mean, his uh, will work. Will the far, I don't know. I don't want to speculate. Will the far side work today? Of course it's going to work. Your license is a genius. Okay, technology news. We're getting through it rel- relatively quickly. Apple Arcade. Now there's an option uh, as opposed to paying $5 a month, mm-hmm. uh, aka $60 a year. You can get a whole annual subscription to Apple Arcade for $50 dollars a year now save ten dollars okay off uh, an annual subscription which tells me one it's not selling as well as they had hoped a couple months into it or that retention has been low right. and in fact reading this news reminded me to cancel my subscription which i did after reading the news <laughs> I'm, I'm just not playing it anymore really like we it's... we talked about like what would the release cadence be and could they mm-hmm. sustain quality for this and i don't think they have enough to justify well Five dollars a month yeah, when, for me when now. When your kids are playing I, iPad games, you'll think otherwise. Yeah, and then, and then back I mean, next, when that happens, I will come back and subscribe to it. But for I was me, say no ads and no in-app purchases. Huge. I, I think they still have yet to prove that they can keep up the quality along with the quantity mm-hmm. of regular releases. Yep. Um, because that's not easy. Games take a long time to be made. Yep. Uh, other uh, quick news. Oh, uh, DualShock 4, you know, as we're probably getting a new PlayStation announced next year, Sony has now a attachment for the DualShock 4 that adds buttons on the back of the controller, kind of like 
flipper buttons almost, where you would use your middle finger to grab as opposed to the, the trigger or the, uh, yeah, the trigger buttons, the shoulder buttons. Um, and it's customization that you can then program you know, and remap okay. two of the buttons to the back. Neat. It's just different uh, type of ergonomics. Hey, we didn't even talk about the Game Awards. Game Awards uh, were last week. We mentioned Jeff Keighley earlier and uh, the Fortnite event, but they dropped a, p- a ton of news, some of which is going to talk about in the, uh, the VR Minute, but so also much. we saw the design for the next Xbox, the right. Xbox Series. X Series. Series X. Series X. Xbox Series X. Right. Xbox Series X might as well be a PC gaming tower. You know, that's what it looked like. Consoles have been PCs for a while now. Yeah. So there they are. They're just it's a PC. Yep. Mm-hmm. And it's looking I'm bet it'll be a really good deal. Like to build yeah. to build that PC costs a lot more. It's fair. But you can only do Xbox games. You're not also right. using it for That's right. And you photo processing and video rendering. Won't be playing your VR games on it. No, that's that's uh something that they have n- even though they mention with the one Xbox One X uh, being able to do, that's not a path that they're pushing for. Uh, calling it Xbox Series X, of course, the speculation is that this is not the only Xbox that they're working on, that it'll be, uh, maybe there'll be a Series Y or that there'll be two models of this mm. because uh, this could presumably be an expensive console and I think they have had success with Xbox One doing the Xbox One X and Xbox One S as well as the, the discless edition. And so going forward, I could see them doing different versions, you know, and with a low, a minimum viable product, the baseline spec being able to run it at, you know, 4K, because this one can do 4K plus ray tracing 120 hertz. And so it's going to be allowing developers to scale up the graphics as people get power, more powerful hardware, much the, like PC gaming. The naming scheme is absurd. It is. I, I If I weren't involved or following the industry, I would not be able to tell you where they drew the line between generations. You know, it's very strange. I, I don't know what the deal is there. PlayStation, yeah. much easier. They like that letter X. I guess so. No more I, number. I mean... It, they were basically screwed when they went to 360. Yeah. Like, at that right. point, it was all over. Xbox. Yeah. 360, 720, 1080. They can go full 1080. 1440? Yeah. What did you do? I don't even know. I, what, what they could call it, if, if not for, just, for numbers. Whatever. Yeah, stupid. It still has to be Xbox. Series X. X Cloud. I mean, I, and at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the naming convention is. I think this is going to be like, they're going to push hard on subscriptions here. Mm-hmm. And that's really going to be... The Game Pass, yeah. That's going to test, you know, wh- where the appetite is for that kind of uh, model. The tower-like design also means that it's probably not going to fit underneath a lot of entertainment centers that right. people have their Blu-ray players it or their Apple TVs. Oriented the other way, though. Can it? I yeah, think so. they did say it could be. Yeah. Mm. And it does have a, a drive. It has a slot yeah. for uh, Blu-rays. Blu-ray discs that will play Blu-ray video. Right, don't know. Because the current Xbox does not. It costs money. Oh, no, though, sorry. The current Xbox does. It's the PS4. Right. That's not. So, of course, I think they will. They will license that out. People will still be buying Blu-ray, um, 4K Blu-rays. Uh, the tower design is something that also is in the Mac Pro, and iFixit did a teardown of the Mac Pro. They gave it a repairability score of 9 out of 10. Well, that's very high. What? They said the, the Festivus miracle is upon us. <laughs> Apple released a Mac that is very very repairable, uh, the only part, and upgradable, and the only part that's proprietary is the SSD that has the T2 Apple security chip on there. Weird. But otherwise, RAM, you can buy, buy your ECC RAM, uh, you can you know, swap things out, and the, you know, it's been well-reviewed so far with the, the, the airflow and the noise, uh, and so... You gonna get Gunther one? So, no. <laughs> For Christmas? You could Sorry, get, Gunther. You could get him some... You might some, get end loops if you're lucky. Why don't you just get him the wheels for it? Oh, That'll be like, yeah. a, that's like 400 <laughs> yeah. bucks right there. Yeah, let's get I him. Mean, I mean, I want to shout out iFixit for their review because they're like, hey, it looks like it can grate cheese. And so they grated cheese on oh, that, it. That hurts my eyes. I love it. That makes me so sad. I don't care for that either. Take that off. Yeah, no. <laughs> why oh. not? Because I have a, a, a baby who makes a mess with cheese all the time, oh. and I'm just kidding. I like their fun <laughs> with expensive it, tech products. It, it was fun. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the world of electric vehicles, there is rumor that Congress in the United States may be extending 
the EV credits, or at least restructuring the EV credits right now. Uh, the car, some electric car makers like Tesla has lowered the prices because of the anticipation anticipation that the EV credits will go away come next year. They reach their number of units sold, where uh, they now the the credits get federal tax rebates get phased out. Mm-hmm. But there's a chance that that will be restructured and extended uh, for another four hundred thousand or up to four hundred thousand units okay, good. cars, which is good for not only. Tesla, potential Tesla owners, and you know what the the market for cars, the price of their cars might go up after that. But be good for existing um, car manufacturers who had done kind of early EVs and eaten into the allocation for tax credits to then still compete and release things like their EV pickup trucks uh, and have their, let their customers benefit from. I, I wonder the if tax part, credit. I wonder if part of the thinking here is that at least Tesla I know has used up all of their tax credits. And they didn't really lower the price much. And so I wonder if Congress was waiting to see if the manufacturers were eating into that tax credit themselves, pricing their cars higher than necessary. Mm. And maybe now that they're seeing that the prices are sort of still sitting up there, maybe that uh, they're saying, okay, Ta- fine. We'll- but tax credits aren't not designed to lower the price of the vehicles. They're, they're more incentives for more manufacturers to get in the space and then compete, and that'll lower the price. And so I don't think the price of the Tesla is going to really come down until Ford and GM and other uh, show the sales that like eat into Tesla's uh, market share. GM makes the bolt, brother. Well, We're doing I, all right. but like not at the same uh, volume it's not. of sales. It's not. I think there's one other piece that you um, uh, you didn't talk about that's important. They're offering a tax credit for used. EV vehicles of twenty five hundred dollars if you make less than a hundred thousand dollars a year mm. or two hundred thousand dollars really married, which I really like because I think EVs are naturally vehicles that that are out of um, uh, the ability to to buy for low income people. Wow! And this is a, a really important sort of uh, that uh, that would be credit. new, right? That's a new thing. And where would that take place after if they were to be passed? Yeah, if it would be passed. And then they said like all subsidies would be gone by 2024. So we'll see. The Bolt has just hit the three-year end of life mm-hmm. for a lot of the first ones to drive off the lot. And uh, the, so the leases are up in many cases. And so that's interesting. And I like I think there is going to be resistance to this like buying a used EV because the battery is a consumable in it but you can check extent. you can check that with the yeah whatever that's called the ocd device or whatever i think people have to get over that that sort of hump that yeah. uh that you know kind of perceptual barrier but it's got it's coming like as you yeah. said like we're in that sort of range where we'll need ways to qualify the the, the batteries for, for and then talk about how many charge cycles and how many miles like that will be a thing that you know carfax and other other uh secondhand car resellers and platforms have to Build in. Well, uh, people are, are using these. What is that called? Your mileage may actually vary. The thing you plug into the port in the car. It's like it's not OCD. It's something like that, right? Um, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, on pe- the bottom of the steering wheel. Right, exactly. People plug that in. There's an Android app that you can run, and it will tell you. Do electric cars have that? Yeah. D- does they, t- Teslas they do. have that? They all have it. Mm. And so uh, at least I own, I'm only on the Bolt. It's forums. OBD, onboard diagnostics, I believe. Oh, nicely done. Um, you plug that in, you use a Bluetooth thing to an Android device, you can actually see how healthy the battery is, and it will give you the, the kilowatt hours, the current uh, capacity of it. Mm-hmm. Hmm. But it still doesn't tell you how many charge cycles it's gone through. Well, I don't think so, but isn't that indicative? I mean, all you really care about is how healthy is it. It's not just charge cycles, because you want to, if it's all fast charging, yeah. that's going to kill the battery. Mm. Um, if it's if you're doing you know, 240 all the time, it's much better on the battery. Yeah. yeah. Again, these are things that people need to be educated about. Uh, last bit of tech news we'll cover um, on your Amazon Smart Assistant device. Now, you can make it sound like a B-A-M-F. <laughs> yes, the Sam Jackson voice has come to the Echo. And guess what? This is not very good. Did you try it, Jeremy? I didn't. It's 99 cents. I, I, I bought it. I tried it. But you have to act. You have to go through like layers of act uh, uh, to get Sam to say stuff to you. I'm I'm telling you, somebody activated it in my household, and no one's owned up to it. Like we, it's activated, and nobody will say that they, <laughs> that they were the one that, that spent the ninety nine cents. It, it's not the. It doesn't become the default voice. You still have to be say yeah. like you know Echo, uh, ask Sam Jackson mm-hmm. to set an alarm for you know. <laughs> 
whatever. Uh, What's the weather or stuff like yeah. that? Yeah, and and he doesn't do everything. No, only yeah. a few things. Yeah, it needs to be the new voice. It has to be the default thing, and that like that's totally possible. They just have to record him saying all the yeah. same sentences and do the machine learning and turn him into the voice. You know, and if it was the case, I'd pay more than ninety nine cents for yeah, it. Yeah, dude. Yeah, like who would you want as your voice? I want like a British echo? soothing voice, Paul like, Bettany. Uh, I, the oh, voice of Vision. A, Vision, that's a good one. I was going to say like a Benedict Cumberbatch came to mind, a, uh, yeah, or an Aussie of some sort, yes. Yeah, before he was Vision, he was obviously that thing, right? He was Jarvis. Jarvis yeah, yeah, exactly. That would, be, right. that, would be the, that would be the voice. Yeah. Although, the guy who does Kit would be great too. Carla Gugino uh, was Karen from Spider-Man Homecoming. So oh, that'd cool. That'd be a good voice yeah. too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fantasy fulfillment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that does it. Oh, you know what? We're not done with tech yet, but before we continue with the next big technology thing we're talking about, I want to let you know that this is only a test this week is made possible with support from Lutron Caseta Smart Lighting. A lot of people think you need smart bulbs to get smart lighting, but there is a smarter way. Caseta's smart dimmers and switches replace the switch on your wall so that all the lights controlled by that switch will act smart. Think about all the places in your home where one switch controls multiple bulbs, ceiling lights, bathrooms, chandeliers, and more. With Caseta, you save money by replacing the switches instead of replacing all those bulbs. Smart bulbs are only smart when the switch is on. If someone flips it off, you can say goodbye to smart control and connectivity, but Caseta switches are always smart, even when the switch is off. With Caseta dimmers, you don't need to buy smart bulbs and enjoy smart lighting. You actually get the best of both worlds, smart lighting control from an app or your voice and control right at the switch. There's also smart features like the smart away feature that randomly turn lights on and off during the evening to make it look like you're home, kind of useful if you're traveling during the holidays or you know if your hands are full like with a baby, you can turn the lights on and off to get them to sleep. Get smart lighting the smart way with Caseda by Lutron Smart Switches. Learn more about Caseda at lutron.com slash test. Once again, that's lutron.com slash test and thank them for sponsoring this week's episode. Is that a Jeremy Williams original? Yes. From back in the day. That's from the PC Gamer podcast days. Wow. So it's the end of, not technically, Technically, it's not really the end of the decade, but it's the end of the the ten years in which we have the number one after two zero, right? In our year, in the way we count our years, it's the end of twenty nineteen. So we will consider it the end of the decade for our purposes, and it's a good time to do a little bit of looking back and thinking about what were the technologies. We are fundamentally a technology show uh, that made the most impact over these past ten years i don't know how you guys want to go over our lists but uh, i think we rotate rotate through as uh, somebody you pick one norm and jeremy goes and well then i go and... how do we do it in a way that are we going to rank them are we going to say no, at the no, end that this no. was the one the most influential technology we, we might not agree impactful yeah. I, I i i concur <laughs> that we might not agree so let's just go as round table one at a time well maybe we'll get to 10 maybe we'll nine but let's talk about the uh, the most impactful technologies. I will start off with something very simple. I'm going to go 3D printers, consumer-based 3D Where printers. Where were we 10 years ago with that? 10 years ago, we had not even built the first cupcake. Wow. 2010 was the year we built the first cupcake. It was made available uh, maybe a year before that. Um, MakerBot? Yeah, remind people what Cupcake is. Uh, Cupcake was the first uh, 3D printer kit released by MakerBot that was uh, a split, at least at that point, it was based off of um, uh, the open source design. RepRap. For, right? RepRap for yeah. 3D printers. Um, and that was uh, out of New York, MakerBot, and we had built the, the the first Cupcake CNC. And then we did our first 3D print in 2010, and <laughs> boy, has the world changed since then. How was the print? It was fine. We built and made a cube. It was okay? Yeah. I mean, by today's standards, was it okay? No. Yeah. God, no. <laughs> I mean, I think the crazy thing that goes along with it is... It, the reason I didn't put that 3D printing on the list is the kind of rise and fall we've seen with it. And I think what's important about the cupcake, it debuted at World Maker Faire. Mm-hmm. And Maker Faire, also gone. 
but it changed. I mean, I, and we, I, not that 3D printing's gone, yeah. but it's gone through some pretty big changes in terms of its hype and the landscape and how it's used. I, I think the trajectory of uh, not just consumer 3D printers, but consumer CNC machines, right? Uh, whether that's a laser cutter, uh, a CNC mill, or even something like a vinyl cutter, that has changed how people, that has merged the digital processes with the physical processes over the past 10 years in a way that's changed making as a whole. And I think the 3D printer is the, the best exemplar of that, including its kind of dips and valleys and over and, and, and the, the, the trough of you know, failed expectations and all that stuff. And I, I got to say, more often than not, I see people in forums that are not 3D printing related saying, oh, I have a 3D printer because there's something that comes out for the Quest or something that you need a 3D printed part in order to you know, do something. And people just have them, like more often than I would expect. Not everybody, obviously, but there's a lot of 3D printers out there because they've gotten so affordable. Um, you have the Quest on the list. I'm just going to jump on that. Yeah, take it. It's, and it's not just Quest. Like, this was the decade of virtual reality hitting, you know, the mass market. Yeah. There was the Oculus Kickstarter in 2013, and then it came to the first DK was the year later, and then DK2, and then all the way to the Quest this year, 2019. And I feel like that trajectory was the most exciting thing about the last 10 years for me. And I did not, ex there were some things I expected to have come further, but I did not expect to be experiencing the fixed off tetherless, PC, tetherless thing VR for the price a, of a game console in an all in one device by the end of the decade. Yeah. That, that is cool. That I mean, that's exactly why I put it on the list. It's the hands free and affordable. Yeah. And, and just like sort of consumer ready, like anyone can do it. Yep. Here, here. I'm going to go weird with my next one. So obviously, smartphone came out in like what, eight, two, 2007, 2008? Yep. iPhone some, came out in 2007. Um, I put the Nexus 4 on here, which came out in 2013. And it was not, my, it's not my favorite Android phone, but to me, it was the one that marked the signaling of smartphones going as commodity products because it was like 350 bucks when it came out. Uh, and it really signaled like Google doubling down on Android. And we saw the pervasiveness of the Android store come out as essentially a real competitor to the App Store. Uh, and I, it really signaled the price, the commoditization of, of smartphones so that everyone had a smartphone in the, in the couple years that followed. And so it wasn't the Nexus 4 in and of itself, but it was like it was the price reductions that started to come at that time so that anyone could get one. Of course, at the end of the decade, we're now going the other way where all the prices are going up. Um, I'm going to go next with drones. Ooh, which drone are you going to pick, though? I, I'm not talking about specific products. I mean, obviously, I think uh, there's the Phantom 2 that really uh, gave us the the first real taste of the potential for um, uh, stabilized... The 2V+. Plus. Uh, yeah, is that the one? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, with the extender, yeah, the Wi-Fi extender, but the potential of using drones as a cinematography tool, uh, the Well, the it was G always GPS available stabilization. To, to professionals, but that mm -hmm. brought it down to consumer level. I mean, same same with VR and same with, you know, same, yeah. same with phones. Right. And, um, and, and then the rapid escalation of drone products, you know, in the five years since, and now the stabilization of the marketplace, you know, you go from Phantom 2 to now the Mavic Pro and the Skydio with autonomous flying and subject tracking. And that is a huge jump of technologies. And then also just the consumer awareness of it and it being deployed uh, in public events, whether it's the Olympics or uh, in Disney parks, like drone technology also is one of those futuristic things that yeah. change not the physical landscape, but the, the skies. I feel like VR has hit like this milestone with the Quest that I can now, I have visibility on the trajectory going forward. Skydio 2 is the whole new thing. And mm -hmm. I feel like that makes me reevaluate drones entirely. We may be at a hockey stick moment. Yeah. yeah. Jeremy? Uh, Echo, man. I mean, it's how my kids get information. So digital assistance. Yes. But in my life, it is Echo. Right. Um, and, so and for a lot of people, it's Apple's device, right? It's, it's, it's Siri for, because that is in... Uh, so many things as well. Yeah, yeah, but the fa the always on, and obviously they have their speaker, but the always on aspect is key. Like mm. it, we have one in every room. The kids basically, you know, ask it for, to set timers, to set alarms for facts about uh, history. Of, um, you want to know something about um, 
John Carmack came up at, at dinner table. My son was like, well, what, what year was John Carmack born? Bam, he got the information. It's just that is ubiquitous in our house. And in, in their life going forward, they will be talking to computers because of Echo. I, I think you also can't get away from a, a couple other consequences. I mean, first of all, it was cheap. That's why I think the Echo is the one to talk about over the Google Assistant and Siri and others. Yeah. Um, but I think it's was at the forefront of us talking about privacy in the home. Because all of a sudden now people are faced with having microphones in their house. Mm -hmm. And they that I think led uh, was a piece of the surge against uh, against privacy we've seen in the back half of this decade for sure. Um, I totally think the the echo is gonna like signal a pretty big change in in what home devices uh, look like and automation. I will, I will say home automation is the thing that I was like, ah, oh, that's the thing that's been most disappointing to me this decade. I feel like that hasn't really progressed in the hmm. way I thought it would. And what do you mean by automation? Like everything from, you know, that promise of like you pulling the car into the garage and yeah. the house lighting up and greeting you with music and everything the sort of machine starts yeah, on. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, just like, you know, the jazz starts playing as you walk up the stairs, the kids just come down and like, oh, dad's home. You know, all of that <laughs> stuff. Wait. Yeah, you're automating your kids to yeah. come downstairs. Well, because they're getting a notification of me <laughs> coming into the garage, right? Arms wide open. No, I mean yeah. like there is that sort of fanciful like it'll make your life more efficient, and that hasn't been my experience of home automation to this point. That it's still a brute force. Well, we're still working on connecting the home. Yeah, and, and I feel like there's so many standards that are fighting for you know supremacy there. I feel like like what you're talking about, really like that's a. Uh, a byproduct of good AI. You know, we want there we want Jarvis. We want somebody at home who is an artificial intelligence who can take care of all that stuff and anticipate our needs. And I feel like that's that's really decades off. Well, well, speaking of AI, that's what I'll take. I'm going to take Deep Mind. Yeah. Uh, uh, just for the concept. Uh, not just for the concept, but what it like represents underneath in terms of the AI improvements because we can talk about Deep Mind as being the the really fantastical thing, it like really pushed the boundaries of computer science and artificial intelligence research in a way that made it very tangible that we see artificial intelligence passing humanity in really specific tasks. Yeah, you know, this is also but, a decade that we saw Watson play on Jeopardy. Right, and but at the same time, what I think that tells is, is the story underneath about the AI and the algorithms that are being integrated into our daily life. Like, you know, the 2000s was like, was like get on the internet, like everyone be connected. Mm -hmm. The 2010s feels like the algorithmic internet where we're all seeing different versions of the internet. And so, and I think that's what DeepMind represents is uh, that AI integration into our life. So if we're uh, doing count, uh, that's number six in terms of how many we want to count them for number. Uh, for me, I will choose next streaming video and the, the cord cutting mm -hmm. as technology. Netflix being you know, uh, one of the pioneers there, but really the ramp up this decade with streaming video options, which coincide with broadband being more available. But do you remember when Netflix like said they would no longer be doing DVDs? People were freaking out. They, they, they like made that a separate business. Yep. And now who, who uses them? Yeah. Yeah. Who subscribes to that? Um, and you know, what, a, what, a, how prescient for, uh, Reed Hastings to call the company Netflix, which works for n and, and not like Disc Flix, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and, yeah. and that works so well. And of course, you know, there's no other things we really need to say. And then also, I guess uh, that ties with a killer apps. So, you know, Netflix when the App Store launch was one of these things that people wanted to have as an essential app, killer app for their whether it's a set top box. Whether it was the what was that one? Not the Roku, but the the, the cube one, the green cube one. You oh that? yeah. Um, uh, to of course things like Apple TV, and now it's just they're not killer apps. They're just part of the essential package. Like you have to be on every. You have to be built into the TVs. Uh, so I would I would coincide streaming services with kind of this this like the baseline these standard apps that we expect everywhere. Um. Were we in the cloud 10 years ago? I'm not, obviously not to this extent, but I feel like you have AWS explosion on here. And I, I think th that's absolutely true. And I'm not- We had Dropbox. Educated enough. To, that's true. That's true. Yeah. That kind of replaced the USB stick at the tail end of the last decade. Yeah, and that was 20, 2008. 
But yeah, I mean, the fact that you can spin up at whatever PC power you need now is is just immensely uh, just democratic. Like everybody has access to what they need, and they don't have to, you know, load up on hardware and fill up warehouses and buy the space and overkill with you know their problem. That's massive, and that is great for small businesses. And that idea of AWS just pervades the cloud. Like you have all of your services now in the cloud. You don't have to buy software anymore. Mm-hmm. You can you can rely on the cloud. And the rise of YouTubers, like is that's the exact same solution there. Like they have relied on a cloud service and Google to provide all of their distribution and ad revenue and uh, their interaction with their viewers. Same with Twitch. They took it in a different direction. That whole thing is really, like, I don't know if I could have named a single YouTuber 10 years ago. Now, granted, I can't name any today either, but but my son can. <laughs> have you met Norman Chan from YouTube? Yeah, it's funny, like, you do consider Tested a YouTube channel, but I, I still go to the website. I the part of the reason I put AWS on there is like it is the backbone of the internet now. Like and I know it it started before 2010. I think it started probably like 07. But now everything runs if AWS goes down like 75% of the internet is down. Yeah. Like the, it is the backbone architecture. It is the reason Amazon is the giant that it is today. It isn't because of prime and delivery. It's like they made their money on AWS. They still make their money on AWS. Um, I'm going to go with the Switch. I'm going to go totally different what? direction. Wow. I think it's the console of the decade. You Think about what came out this decade. Um, Xbox One, X360, Xbox One, One PS4. PS4, PS3 came out this decade too. Um, but the Switch is... A mobile mobile gaming done right on in terms of a console system, it has two of the best games of the decade of in, all time uh, in Odyssey and Breath of the Wild. Yeah, and uh, it I think it, it has it taken the the whimsy that we've known Nintendo for uh, that we saw integrated in the Wii and brought it forward. Um, it is a, like my my kid's favorite console. It's my favorite console. And when I look through the list of all the consoles of this decade, it is the gaming console. You would say that over like gaming on iPad. Yeah. So, I mean, the iPad came out in 2010. So mm-hmm. that was going to be on the list. But I think that's going to be on the list for something different. Like, I don't think it's because of the iPad should be on the list because of gaming. I think it's just a ubiquitous tool for in tablets, everyone's yeah, house. Right, right. I got to say, Tablet la- computing. L- the Labo stuff is some of the best gaming experiences I've had this year. And totally. it, it had nothing to do with the video games. Like It was all about making an interface to, to play a video game. It was fun. I'm going to go with, uh, we're on 10 now, I'm going to go with EVs. Mm-hmm. Electric vehicles, you know. Whiffs. I mean, you should just say it. You should yeah. say the Tesla. It's the Tesla. It's the Model 3. Why do you say that? Because it's the one that made EVs cool. um, part of um, of culture, yeah. Like there were EVs, like going back to the Leaf, and we can go back yeah. a lot farther than that. Well, I think it made it sexy. Uh, the, the, the the ironic thing about the early EVs was they were fun to drive, but they didn't look fun to drive. Like Tesla made a sexy car, and also the range, the range made it viable. Yeah, and that's not and that's not even talking about the technology platform that they've built in, for, um, not only the charging stations that everyone's kind of mimicking now and building their own kind of charging network, but also the autonomous driving, which I still think is unparalleled. I, I think even some of the backbone stuff, like the battery manufacturing, which is like not as visible, but they invested so much money into that space, they forced other car manufacturers to get in, uh, you know, in like years ahead of where they had planned to get in. And you and the Model 3 was the reason why. I mean, you, you can talk about like the Roadster and the other ones that came before, but it was really the Model 3 that that solidified it. Um, I feel like we're wrapping it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm gonna give honorable mentions, or well, just like. Well, I have like a, a topic I want to insert here. Okay. Pinball, because you guys don't understand. Well, we have tilt warning. Well, well, I don't want to do tilt warning, but no. the, the, the whole you don't understand this because you guys come from technology world. <laughs> but pinball, uh, ten years ago, the community was on Usenet. Yeah. That's where every conversation happened. Rec games, pinball. That's how backwards it is. To this day, they haven't embraced the internet or Wi-Fi. But 
over the past 10 years, we've moved to the web, <laughs> right? So that's good from the community standpoint. But competitive pinball has blown up. The number of registered players has more than quintupled. There are, there's now stereo sound in the games, right? The, the lights have moved from incandescence to LEDs. All these things that you guys take for granted from like, you know, we would have had 10 years ago in any other industry, pinball's finally caught up. And there are new machines, lots of new machines being released. The, there's been like 28 major releases from Stern over the past 10 years, I, wow. think, I think I counted. The best player in the world has become a designer. Uh, women have been embraced by the community and have their own leagues and have their own competitive circuits. Uh, it's been a fantastic... As well as participating in... Oh, of course, in, in you know, gender-neutral uh, <laughs> competitive um, competitions. It's been a phenomenal 10 years for pinball. 10 years ago, I swear to you, we thought pinball was dying. Hmm. Everybody was collecting old games, like 90s games, because Stern was uninspired. And we just had a, a game called Tilt the Battle to Save Pinball come out, wherein Steve Ritchie, world-famous designer, said pinball's slowly dying. Boom, 2010 to now has been the most exciting decade for pinball, I think, ever. That was a documentary in 2008. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got yeah. It. Got it. Uh, my only honorable mention is Raspberry Pi, um, which I think goes hand in hand with the Arduino. I just put the Raspberry Pi on there because it was the first time that I saw Wi Fi on a board like that. Yeah. Um, and that was easy and cheap. Yeah. Other emissions, you know, obviously drive sharing and app, uh, the, the, the app based. Um, sharing economy is a f technology that we're in the mix of. It's the later half of this decade, but has has changed the way people get around and connect with each other in in a commercial way, in tra transactional way. Uh, and then also, you know, the iPad obviously as a as the tablet form factor, mm -hmm. uh, which is derivative of the phone form factor, but we realize now it is not just the big phone, which it was when it first came out in 2010. It is a completely viable, standalone complete computer platform that lives alongside uh, laptop desktop as well as the phone. You know, one the of the screen. arguments I heard for um, biggest, you know, uh, tech products of the decade was Instagram. And I was like, Instagram? Um, like, I get it has a ton of users. It's because they associate Instagram with like two real innovations. Like it's where endless scroll came about, which is like now just a function of almost every app we use. And also, and probably more importantly, it drove the smartphone as a camera and connected real world to tech and actually drove it the other way where tech was driving real world interactions. And I would even go one step further and say Instagram was the app that uh, turned everyone into not just a photographer, uh, like the way the smartphones did, but also a photo editor. Mm -hmm. And it threw the power of networking and s social connection, uh, encouraged people to learn these previously very complicated uh, skill sets, like photo editing and tweaking photos, just using this the layer of filters. And now everyone understands photo editing in a way, everyone's like a professional photo editor. I thought that was astounding. Well, the, the democratization of, of editing photos can be applied to web design websites as well over the past 10 years. You got Facebook now. Every, nobody makes websites anymore. It's Facebook groups. Pages, like, yeah. You just create a new group, and you got, you're the admin, and you invite people. Is it private? Is it public? Is it you want a header graphic? It's all done right there. It's, it's not even like install your own WordPress anymore, which used mm -hmm. to be the easy thing. Well, Squarespace. Drag and drop. Right. <laughs> yes. Templates. <laughs> yes. Uh, are we missing anything? Wearables, electronic wearables, are still kind of on the edge of that I right now. I feel like now. wearables some kind of failed. Notable failures, of course, with Google Glass. I don't know the, the watch. It. I don't know if anyone thought it's going to be all about fitness. Like, and that once now that they figured that out, I think that they're progressing. I guess when I say it failed, I think there's a lot of promise and hype around health, and that hasn't come to fruition yet. I thought you were you were heralding the iPhone, the iWatch 4. Yeah, but uh, I do herald it. I think the tech is there. I think the mm. societal adoption, the cultural right. um, valuing of that isn't there. Well, no. maybe the acceptance of things like AirPods and, uh, and of course, uh, Apple Watch yeah. is a sign of things to come, wearable technology. That the 20s will be the era of the accessory? The digital accessory. Mm -hmm. um, if, we're ha if, we have, if there are any other notable missions... Let us know in the comments what were your biggest technology products, trends, 
ideas, even failures yeah. of this past decade. And we'd love to hear from you about that. Moment of science. Okay, I'll admit, I'm the person on the show that really liked the list format. So I'm doing another list. I'm doing top five moments of science this decade. Uh, and we're going to start with one that Jeremy is going to play you, for us. Are you ready for it? Mm -hmm. Okay. This was September 14th, 2015, when this happened. Do you know what this is? Lego? This is the sound of two black holes uh, circling each other yeah. halfway across the universe. Uh, I'm going to put up on the screen, this is the actual detection that happened uh, that day in uh, Louisiana and Washington. These are the graphs that were actually recorded. Uh, and then they ran it through an algorithm that actually produced that sound. Um, September 14th was the day they actually made the detection. We didn't hear about it till February, the year following, because they were trying to confirm it. Um, this is the detection of the most powerful event ever observed in the universe. Um, <laughs> and, uh, A snap, it, and as it were. <laughs> this, uh, this happened when they announced it in 2016. It was 100 or 90, yeah, no, it was 100 years after Einstein first theorized that, um, that we would have gravitational waves. Uh, as a consequence of black holes. So it was just sort of amazing serendipity around mm. that that kind of timing. Uh, but I think that sound rippled across culture as much as it did I can give science. you some more. That's just a different algorithm where they changed the octave up higher for that. Uh, there's <laughs> been multiple, um, there's been two other uh, observations of, of black holes spinning around each other uh, since in terms of the gravitational wave. Oh, so detection. now it's old news. Yeah, yeah, now it's like whatever. That yeah. show me something new. Show me three black holes. Um, twenty. I'm gonna go forward to. Oh, well, go backwards to 2012. Do you, you know what this picture is? This is from July 5th, 2012. I know. You know because you've been there. You've I've been in that yeah, room. Exactly. That's why we. Jeremy? Uh, I'm guessing it's NASA, but I have no idea. No. This is in Switzerland. This is the day they announced the detection of the Higgs boson oh, at well. CERN. Okay. Uh, and this is a monumental achievement because even though it confirmed a lot of the standard theory, uh, standard um, uh, model for particles, this is the first time we saw and observed the Higgs boson through the decay of muons through this billion-dollar detector. A uh, multi-billion-dollar detector, the biggest machine where, in the world. Yeah, where they smashed two protons together, and in the decay of the muons that formed, they're able to observe the signature of the Higgs boson or the God particle. Uh, and Peter Higgs was actually there. Whoa! Uh, the person who theorized it, he was in the room uh, that day, uh, and it was a. I mean, that was huge, right? Everyone heard about the Higgs boson. Yeah, the God particle. All right, number three. Thanks, Dan Brown. Was two moments in two thousand. 17. Um, one was April 22nd, 2017, and the other was August 21st, 2017. And it was when people actually went out and uh, did something about science. So the first was I, the March for Science, which I was obviously involved in, where more than a million people around the world marched uh, uh, in protest around um, uh, uh, science. And then science August policies, the science policies. And August 21st, um, was the great American uh, solar eclipse, where 4 million Americans uh, participated around the country by going out and viewing the solar eclipse. We hadn't, in the previous decade, had moments remotely close to this, where there was such mass participation uh, in events centered around science. So I think they'll resonate for years to come in the sense of, like, yeah, science can be an engine of people actually coming together as much as the discoveries themselves. All right, two. Oh, we're, we're doing this in order? I'm doing this wow. kind of in order. That's exciting. Uh, two was the publishing of this paper. Um, so the title is, you want to read the title? A uh, Programmable Dual RNA Guided DNA Endonucleus in Adaptive Bacterial Immunity. Do you know what this is? CRISPR. This is the paper that launched CRISPR. This is what... Uh, uh, August 17th, 2012, 
So this is started the DNA editing revolution in this paper. It's only been seven years since this paper came out. We're now at the point where we have human trials going on where we're changing their DNA to completely change um, the outcomes of uh, deadly diseases. We're using this technology to essentially neuter mosquitoes and wipe out whole populations to prevent disease transmission. This is seen as one of the holy grails of biology right now because of the potential it has to deal with genetic uh, um, uh, causes of disease. And it's only seven years ago that the first paper on this came out. Do If, they, if this gene is edited out, uh, say a deadly disease, is it inheritable? Do they still pass that gene on? Uh, so there's two different ways to do CRISPR editing. You could do it in a somatic cell. Um, or you could do it in a cell that actually is, um, is heritable too. So like the idea is like, yes, you can edit it in a cell like your skin cell that doesn't pass on to any other generation. It just affects you. But if we do it in a cell that does pass along like an egg or in, inside of a sperm cell, mm. well, now you're changing generations. There's a huge argument about, um, the ethics of making those moves because any, uh, future traits, first of all, we don't know the consequences of that. But more important, those people that have uh, the uh, generations that come, they have no consent, a way of giving any consent to that change. Well, they what have, about the trauma? They have no consent to ch the change that comes from natural selection either. Yeah, but that's the argument, right? You just said the word natural selection, yeah. right? Like we are making a choice here. I hear you. So, But we make choices in natural selection as well. We do, right? But that's why there's an ethics argument around this. This isn't a, a decision that only scientists can make. I think we can decide right here. Can you edit out the trauma? <laughs> the trauma of what? Just the trauma of 11-2. Wounds need air to heal. <laughs> oh, no. I watched He's out. quoting Watchmen now. Oh, dear. Um, but I think the, if I can find my cursor, the number one thing from this decade. Drum roll. Um, is this. Do you have the paper? This is May 17th, 2013, an observation that happened at the Mauna Kea Observatory. This is the first time in um, a, in human times that the carbon dioxide level on the Earth passed 400 parts per million uh, as a regular measurement. We're now on uh, at about 408 parts per million. This line was uh, kind of arbitrarily set, but set by scientists as like, this is a no coming back moment for climate change. Climate change has been the science story of the decade. It's going to be the science story of the next decade too. Uh, this is the point when I think it broke uh, the hearts and minds of a lot of scientists that uh, we're in trouble. I mean, most of the active, like well, the, one of the largest activist groups around climate change is 350.org, which is about 350 parts per million. Uh, but when this came out May 7th, 2013, it was a weekly average that week at that observatory. This is the first time we crossed that and we've stayed above it. And I think it will continue to be the biggest science story going forward. I hate to end on a downer, but I think it is the most important science story that happened. Are you ready to announce you're going to get an electric vehicle? Uh, oh, I want to get an electric vehicle for my next car. It's Very just good. that I want to do, I, I want to wait till the end of my current car's life cycle to get an electric vehicle. I'm not in a rush to. There you go. The earth is, for sure. <laughs> The VR Minute, virtual reality this week. Oh, a bunch of stuff happened in VR this week. Uh, let's start with some, some big stuff. Well, I think last week we talked about hand tracking being released. Has it uh, pushed to your headset, your Quest, yeah, Jeremy? it did. Your experiences? It did. Uh, you know what? I feel like it's been... Uh, uh, like a cons back? conservatively tweaked since mm. we tried it at, at Connect, at Connect, where I felt like we could do a little bit of, of occlusion. Like, thank you, of occlusion at Connect, and now it just stops. If you bring your hands close to one another, it just fades it fades out. out. It yeah. doesn't show you the errors. It yeah. just fades it out. Uh, but you know, it's I can't wait to see what developers do with it 
That's going to be the That's fun the whole part. point yeah. of this. I mean, I want to see this in big screen ASAP. Or just for gestures, not for UI navigation. Not right? at all. Just for, just for communication. Like, that's the kind of app where it would, where it would really thrive, like, right out of the gate. Yeah. So that you, you don't have to interact with some sort of, sort of spatial interface. You're just interacting with other people. And being able to emote with your hands and fingers, I think, would do a world of difference for communicating body language. You know, we actually haven't seen that, because even with the Horizon demo we saw at Connect, it was social interaction, but we were still using the touch controllers. Yeah. I don't know whether the data points that they're analyzing through the DSP headroom that they found in the Quest can, uh, you know, can be efficiently transferred in low latency over network so that you can tap into that as a multiplayer experience. I wonder if it's just, if it's obviously more efficient to just render it locally, but how much more work would it be to send that extra positional data uh, for a multiplayer Because you social. have the entire skeletal structure. Exactly. I'm sure that and on some level it's going to be possible. If, if they send right. you know, every few frames, new updates, if they send like an aggregate of all of the positions at once, that kind of thing, they'll, fi they'll figure it out. Yeah, it's an essential part of social VR. Yeah. Uh, the, sure. For me, that's going to be huge. I, it makes me almost want to try podcasting in big screen again. Once if they once that's in there. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So yep. I have a dumb question because I, I've tried it out. I get the, the push. Yeah. What is it active in any games? It's no, just it's just active UI. in home. And right? in fact, the SDK wasn't even available when they released it. It became yeah. available this week, I think. So really, you can only try it out in home at this point. Uh, you can browse the web. You yeah. can, uh, yeah, you can't do much. Uh, we have a couple of updates for apps. Big screen cinema speaking was a big, big speaking of big screen. This is something they had kind of teased and tested with the group viewing of movies of things like Top Gun a year ago mm -hmm. now. Top Gun 3D. And now they have announced a partnership with Paramount to do movie screenings that you can buy um, at, at regular intervals uh, and watch with other people in VR. Yeah, I gather this has been their agenda. Like, this has been what they're, they've been shooting for all along. Um, uh, four movies a week will be... You know, in the theater, you can go and watch any of them. The 2D ones will be uh, $4. The 3D ones will be $5. And you, the show times are every... Per person. Per person. The show times are every 30 minutes. And uh, you have 40 hours to watch the film. Uh, you can go back and watch it again if you want to, as long as it's been the 40-hour window. And the films are still in the movies because they do change every Friday to a new batch. They're releasing in 10 countries, although not all movies are available in all 10 countries. Um, it, it's definitely interesting. I feel like this is the beginning of something that could be really, really cool. Yeah. I'm not sure how popular it will be because there aren't like events yet. Like, not, I, not they're not new releases. These are well, that's library. That's releases. that's actually that's the better first point to start on is that they're they're not doing new releases. They're library releases, as you said, and uh, apparently Paramount is just their first partner, but Paramount wants to see this succeed before they're willing to dive in with the new releases yeah. um, so if they if they can get enough people in there to show that that it can generate revenue they'll be able to bring new releases and i think that would be a much more compelling argument for this type of experience so like they don't they didn't announce this but the movie i want to see that i think is like in two weeks is top gun yeah top gun 3d give me that yeah, we, that's what we did. We got a free viewing of Top Gun as our test. Oh, last you year. guys watched that? No, no, yeah, yeah. Well, that was a while ago. That's yes. that was yeah. But aren't they doing it again? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. I'll be part of the library. Yeah. But I mean, it's a. I think it's going to be a little bit of a tough sell because five dollars is, you know, it's a price. It's comparable to a price for rental. In fact, it is contractually comparable to to a rental. They mm -hmm. have to charge the same as iTunes does and everybody else. Mm, interesting. So it's a matter of does the value of it being three D and in VR is that going to be compelling enough for Quest and Rift owners? Or is it the social aspect of being able to watch with other people in VR, which encourages big screen to develop more of those social tools? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like that's where the real appeal of this is. Like if you can do a live event with a director Q&A yeah. before yeah. or after the show right. with the director as an avatar. J.J. Abrams swooping, swooping down in a, I, in a uh, <laughs> you know, Millennium Falcon. J exactly. J.J. Abrams, this is not Fortnite, unfortunately. This is big screen, and it's a small user base mm -hmm. compared to Fortnite. Mm -hmm. uh, but So if you can get a B-list actor, somebody sure. who was in the film, to come and share their experiences. Every day there's a Fathom event 
thing at a movie theater where that's happening. Right. My, and we're just talking about the same thing in VR. My personal dream would be to get the Rift Tracks guys to do a live show, not on screen, but in person in VR. Get the three guys to stand up there at their podiums and do perform it for everybody who wants to show up. They already do Fathom events in the, in the yeah. movie. movie. You got to build tools for those performers, essentially, to have a different UI so they can have notes yes. and reference and things. Okay. I asked them after, I asked uh, Darshan after this was announced if they have those tools, and he said yes, and that the, these type of live events are a part of their roadmap. So that's what I'm most excited about. Give people a reason to go to a specific showing at a specific time, make it an event, and I think they'll have no problem. Make it a li live showing. Like, how yeah. much would you pay if, like, Hamilton did this? <laughs> what are you mean? What are you talking about? Like where you could watch a live performance? Oh, of I a thought Broadway you meant like showing I'd see Hamilton. avatars performing Hamilton. No, okay, no, okay. no, no. <laughs> wow, that would be bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, but like you could watch like the Broadway performance of Hamilton Absolutely. that night. Well, venues does that all the time. There's yeah. all kinds of live events in the Oculus app, and that's like that is this. Those ideas need to mesh. You're exactly yeah. right. Like mesh live events with this big screen experience and. The other question that I had when I heard about this was, well, you can kind of already do that. If you People own, stream if you own these movies yes. already, or if you have an account on something that can stream it, mm -hmm. you can open up your own room to yeah. a handful of friends and right. stream it privately um, or to a public room, but there's a small cap of users. And that's the borderline legalities are, are borderline there. Right, but but Big Screen has figured that out by the maxing out the number of players that can be in there. And high bit rate streaming well, on their end. that's the problem is that you can only do a three megabit uploads on your videos that you stream. Mm. They're doing 10 megabit. And, For 3D videos. And they have access to the raw you know, files from Paramount. Yeah. And so especially yeah. when it comes to the 3D stuff, that's going to look far better with their streams plus it's gonna you know everyone's gonna be in sync there's not gonna be dropouts uh, so there's definitely gonna be a quality advantage to using their system what I'd, I'd just like to see live events I'd like to see more of a re reason for people to, to join in like live events but also maybe you know things you can do in that space before and after the movie together there's an arcade let's make the arcade real add a void you know style VR game that people can play as a co-op group for the first VR meet cute the what? Meet cute. What's that? You know, people happen to find 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 love in VR at a movie theater oh, and a wow. VR experience. Yeah, I'll be a, a story to tell. Yeah, and r with showtimes every thirty minutes, what are the odds you're going to have a packed theater of actual people? Like it's pretty low. I mean, that's that's like even like spacing them out makes it convenient, but it also decreases the chances. Yeah, that's of having that's a trade off. They want a lot of people. users. Yeah. yeah, yeah, scale. So it's hard. It's a hard. It, it's 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 super cool. And I think it's a sign of things to come. Like, if I had a long distance relationship with somebody, no doubt we would be watching movies together in big screen. That's a great solution. But I don't know. I'll be very curious to see how, without new releases and without like real uh, carrots for people to like dive into something to, for an event, mm. I wonder how, how successful this will be. I wish them the best. Uh, we have on the Oculus Quest side a little bit of news. There was a surprise drop from Ubisoft, Bridge. Crew is now on Quest. Uh, there is kind of cross-buy with Rift. If you bought it in the Oculus Store, if you bought the DLC, it's free for you. If you no. did not buy the DLC, it's $10 yeah. if you own the original Bridge Crew. Uh, I haven't had a chance to try it on Quest yet, so I don't know how performance is. Uh, but Every, I'm, I was very surprised. Everyone says it's great. The only problem is you do have to still use, the, uh, what is it, Uplay? Yeah, you for you login. To, yeah, it's, so you have two to sync, forms up, of sync up your account. And some people were having trouble like, right. with that sync initially, and I think they're starting to get over it. Yeah. Another surprise on the Quest side, uh, Skybound Interactive. Uh, they, uh, we, I previewed the Walking Dead Saints and Sinners at New York Comic Con. That's coming out early next year. And they had a roadmap that PS4 will have a release for that uh, next year as well, as well as on Oculus Quest by Q3 2020, and it was not a game that I expected could be ported to Quest since the, the graphics are pretty good and yeah. the amount of zombies they have on the screen. So maybe they'll scale that down. You know, people who've played Arizona Sunshine on Quest know that it's it's a it's different flavor of that game mm -hmm. uh, on the mobile hardware, uh, but I'm glad that developers are able to build high-end games and then also then uh, go that direction, PC first, and then Quest second, as opposed to Quest first with a, a PC version, which some game developers have done. Uh, Oculus Link is uh, still in beta. It's working well for people. And now people have uh, found that you can 
actually adjust the rendering resolution on your host PC, it does require quite a bit of tuning and hacking. You have to go you know, into developer mode, actually edit some, some code, um, and there are some variables that you can, can tweak. I don't think you can increase actually bit rate, but the render resolution hmm. you, can, you can bump up to uh, various degrees of success for people who kind of have those powerful computers. I wish it's something that Oculus would make transparent in the Oculus setting, even if it's a toggle between you know, like a, a base level rendering and something that pushes max bit rate, max resolution. Uh, but right now it's something that you just have to dig around to find. There's also a new version of SideQuest. This is the front end that lets you easily sideload APKs uh, for third party developer developed apps and super easy to install. Uh, you know, we're not gonna go through our list of favorite side quest things, but I will concede, Jeremy, man, Quake 2 yeah. and VR. You, you played it? Yes. You liked it? It's it so good. much fun. I love it. Yeah. Since you, since you played it, they updated the engine. This now comes with high HD textures. Oh. So you gotta re sideload it, and okay. your saves won't work, but it's yeah. worth it because it really, a lot of the elements look much better. The two handed controls, the you, free. You I tried that? I did, yes. Two handed, yeah. Two handed it, machine gun. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, the fact that it just works. Um, at, when you first load it up, it actually is in a windowed mode, and you gotta, gotta like, press a toggle, and then it does the full full field of view. Yeah. But once you're in the full field of view, it's comfortable. I mean, anyone who's comfortable with free locomotion on a uh, in a VR shooter, uh, this is perfect for them. It's exact. I, now I want Quake Three. Now yeah. I want Deathmatch. It really feels native. Like it feels like a like a made for VR game. It's yeah. It, but you're right. It's intense. Yeah. But I don't think we'll see uh, Quake Three on this gen. I think we'll probably have to wait on that. Yeah. He's working on Doom next, actually. Mm, I saw some some uh, videos of that, and that looks good, too. Uh, so the new version of SideQuest does some cool things. You can now install remotely, and you can also stream from your Quest to your PC for use with OBS using uh, screen copy. And I think that's relatively it. We talked about Boneworks last week. They did announce that there would be quick saves Okay. Um, in Boneworks and not just chapter-based saves because people are spending a lot more time in the levels than they anticipated. And that's what I would recommend. If you're on the fence about Boneworks, wait till early next year when they release the quick saves before you start playing or else you might get frustrated because some of the stuff, you don't want to lose progress and get stuck on a level for, for hours on end. Um, what was the racing game that came out yesterday? The racing game? Yeah, on Quest. It, it's the old school. They used to play it with, on, the, on the Rift, the original Rift with a gamepad. Um, you remember Project Cars? No, no, it's uh, mm. what was this? I'm checking it out. Where's the new release? You know, I did play a little bit of that Twisted Metal style racing game. Yeah, what do you think? Death Lap. Death Lap. It makes me really want a GTA style game. Oh my in god! VR. Well, that's <laughs> that's not that's not a small request. No, I, and I don't even think like that at that scale. You mean like open world? No, like I don't even need open world. It can be low res graphics. I like the idea. The, the best thing I like about Death Lap is that one hand can be you know tied, can be latched to a steering wheel, and yeah. you're using that as your drive mechanic. Did you do that? Did I you... did do that, and I actually and what... it did not. I did not like their implementation of it because theirs was just... not positionally done. It was just the hand rotation. That's interesting because I actually thought it was smart because I thought this would get tiring, whereas mm. this wasn't. Like, I mean, you can also people drive different ways all the time. Yeah, but yeah, I yeah. wish they kind of mapped a virtual steering wheel for yeah. me to even snap onto right. as a way to do like big turns, yeah. slow turns. And I've always wanted a type of um, kind of a hunting game, like like the, um, the, the ship, where you're yeah. in a map in cars with NPCs and two people are trying to find each other and, and suss you out from the, the NPCs and then grab a, a, you know, a blaster and shoot you and, find, and, and hunt each other. Okay. I've always wanted that. Uh, Radial G is what, ah, what got it came out. Got it, got so it. that is the most intense racing game I've ever played in VR. I would r highly caution anybody who's sensitive to against this game. If you want an intense experience, check it out. It's a it's a racing game. And what what it has, it's there aren't many racing games. If Death Lap and this one and VR carts, I mean those are the, really the only ones. And I want racing games. When I feel like these games that that all those games ha sort of have in common is they're they're not straight racing games. You know, they're weapon-based racing games. And and I want, I enjoy Death Lap just from a racing perspective. Like I wish I could turn off the weapons. I want to be able to power slide and hit ramps and race against other players without having to worry about you know someone hitting me and going to last place. Like that's that's what I want. I I want someone to remake stunts 
or you know test drive like the classic games or, or uh virtual racing like that would be my dream is if somebody were to remake those in vr please do it there have been a lot of other releases we haven't talked about vacation simulator gives that on quest yes um where thoughts go is that on quest that is have you played that no you guys should check that out where thoughts go it won awards uh on pc it is absolutely sublime you get into these spaces and they're surrounded by orbs and you touch them and you hear you, there's a question that, that hovers in front of you and all of the orbs that are surrounding you are people's responses to those questions they've launched the app they have played the game and the, in order to progress from one level to the next you have mm -hmm. to answer the question oh. with your voice all of the orbs are people's answers so it's like, what did you want to be when you grew up, when you were a kid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just like the most intimate experience you've had in VR. That's, you, that's really putting yourself cool. out there. It's awesome. And so they're like, you, you, you're surprised because you expect them to be flip answers or mm -hmm. people joking around or saying, oh, my mic's... Do they curate? They must curate on. after the, the submitted... I'm sure that there's some sort of filtering, right? Probably. Yeah. But yeah. It, it, they're great. And then it's just really, it's super cool. Because once you hear them, you now want to give an authentic answer. Oh. And it keeps you from trolling. Mm. Um, so that's... Does well, it though? <laughs> that's well worth your time but uh, even more than that first of all Waltz of the Wizard is out uh, Climb is out I'm not sure we mentioned that um, but love Waltz the Wizard Norman Chan yes you have to play before anything else The Under Presents oh yeah these are from the folks who did Virtual Virtual Reality yeah I've been waiting for uh, a good chunk of time in the holiday break but that is 100% on my list do you know what this is no I, I don't want to know I know it's been highly recommended but I, I want to come in cold. I want to go in cold can, can I tell you a little bit? Uh, Stay I looking I won't, for it. I won't spoil the, the mood, the vibe of this the okay. scene. I just want to tell you, it's, it's interactive theater. That's all I need. Done. 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 That's what I want. That's Between it. now and March, mid-March, yeah. there are, are live actors who are in the game who are not other players, although there are other players, uh -huh. but you'll see live performances by people who are hired to work in the game yeah. for the next three months. They're U.S. based, so you can't play too late U.S. time. You have to sort of join the game when people are working in the U.S. But it, you will love this. All right, but it's sold. You do have to have a chunk of time set aside. It uh, that's, is that's exactly why I've been waiting. It is a game that's comfortable in VR. It does not rush you through things. Great. Okay. Great. great. Uh, there's also a game called Hello Puppets that's out on Rift, uh, and it's uh, kind of inspired by Five Nights at Freddy's. Or at least shares a lot of that kind of like horror uh, comedy. Uh, lineage, and this is interesting because one of your hands is a sock puppet, and it comes alive, and so it becomes an NPC that has scripted dialogue, and that, but you kind of are holding it, and and it is talking to you, and Whoa. I like that that design. Uh, so Hello Puppets as well, but yeah, I one hundred one percent want to play um, the other game, the Under Presents. Uh, the Under <laughs> Presents. Thank you. That does it for the not final episode this year. Of this is only a test. So you say. Uh, so I in, say. Just in case so Norm, say we all. Norm can't get us back together for uh, a mm -hmm. final episode this year, I want to shout out um, Wohawk, Justin, aka Speed, all of the people that submitted outros for us, and generally like the people that have been nice throughout you know my run here at this is only a test. I always say nice things. Um, even the ones that created like the the bot that like tracked who had more time followers. Oh, 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 I thought you were time saying timestamp bot. bot. Timestamp bot guy, so good. That's awesome. You are saying this having not even read the outros thread, aren't you? Do you remember what Norm said at the end of last week's show? Uh, no. He said, I hope there's a good one at the end of the year, right? And I said, that was a good one, right? Yeah. Well, there's a note from Jesse in our forum. In from Mohawk. Yeah, from Mohawk. Instead of a new outro. Oh, <gasps> no. Is he yeah. quitting? <laughs> Sorry, guys. You were right, Norm. My outros have not been as good as they can be of late. No, they've been great. I'm going to step back for a while and only post a track if I feel it is really good. What? Oh, no. <laughs> I've scared him away. What have you done, I'm so Norm. sorry. Oh, man. What? Have you done? Those are the highlight of the show for me, Wohog. So whenever you feel so inspired, I will be eternally grateful. We got to yes. give them give them the material. Yeah. Well, I you know I don't know how that's done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty to mine in this episode. Thanks for listening. We'll use not a new outro this week. Let's go with the classic Wohog. Let's go for like a super old one. I'm going uh, two years back. Oh my goodness. From something from Justin, aka Speed. Uh, probably a classic.
Let's see here. It's called Jeremy Jobs. Hi there, I didn't see you. That's it. Did you walk around the house like this, like holding your chin a I little bit? I put on my Lennon glasses. Yeah, I made everyone call me Steve. That's it. Hey, Out of context, that was great. We didn't do a tilt warning, but I want you guys to know, you'll probably be more excited than I am, there is going to be a Rick and Morty pinball machine. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's sold out in a matter of hours. Their it's, voices, It's already too? done. Yeah. No, no. It's yeah. Like total involvement. Uh, only 750 made, I believe. What? So yeah. few. Yeah, yeah. And they sold out extremely fast. Oh my, that's so, going to be a moneymaker yeah. if you operate. Yeah, you, yeah, definitely. And... Also, if you bought one to sell it. <laughs> sure. But also market. just like that transporter gun, that's going to be awesome. It's on there. It's part of, yeah, the, part of the plunger. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a pickle rick. Uh, yeah, it looks good. It's designed um, in part by a guy who made this uh, game called uh, Total Nuclear Annihilation that people like. But Bowen Karens is doing the rules. He's like a world champion pinball player. So it's, yeah, it's highly, highly anticipated. Thought you guys would like that. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. See you next week. Will ya? <laughs>